My name is Adrian Nanchev, and this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So what I do, in this podcast certainly, is find people from all over the world doing remarkable things already with their life, and bring you their story, their journey, their expertise, their history. Today I have with me Kelly, Kelly McRae. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so please, Kelly, tell the world, explain to the world, who are you? What are you doing? What do you believe in? What's your story? And what difference are you making in the world? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. I really do appreciate it. Uh, my name is was mentioned as Kelly McRae. And my story is I sold off everything that I earn, owned and I moved to a country I'd never been to before because of a health care issue. Uh, affordable health care, quality health care in the United States or uh, a situation that I had was basically non-existent. I was diagnosed February of 2016 with an autoimmune disease called lupus, and it is incurable, and it does a lot of things to your body that people don't necessarily realize. So basically what I've been doing since um, contracting this disease or getting that diagnosis has been bringing awareness uh, as far as what lupus is, what it does, talking to people about what we're eating, how it affects our bodies, and just kind of giving common sense, everyday advice on things, you know, helping people change their perception and in a nice, funny, kind of comical way, uh, while changing their perceptions, helping them to mind their own business <laughs> is kind of what I'm doing. Oh, so sorry to hear about this, Kelly. Um... You talk about raising awareness to it. Can you could you elaborate on the details, please, and what you want people to know about it? Yes, absolutely. Lupus is what's considered an, an invisible disease because when you look at someone who is battling lupus, most of us hear frequently, you don't look sick. But lupus really uh, attacks a lot of people all over the world. In the U.S., it attacks somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million people. It is a disease that actually works on inflammation, so, and, and it has no discrimination whatsoever from your tissues, organs, uh, your, your major parts, your skin, it, it just doesn't care. So uh, in the time that I've had lupus, my heart has been swollen three different times, my liver has been swollen, my lungs have been swollen, and so you are always in some level of pain. Of course, you've got joint pain as well. So there's always some chronic pain that's involved in it, but most people think that you're over-exaggerating and that it's not, you know, it's all in your head because they look at you and you look really well. But, you know, I typically will ask people, you know, what do you, does your appearance change when you have a headache? Or does your appearance change when your stomach hurts, but you still don't feel well? So, bringing awareness so that people can understand, not necessarily, I shouldn't say understand, but so that they can have more compassion. And so that also you can understand the symptoms of the disease, because unfortunately in the U.S. at least, it takes on average three to five years before the medical professionals can even diagnose it, because the symptoms are constantly moving. You know, I may have a swollen heart, the next person may have swollen lungs, Another person may just be losing weight for no reason, and another person may be gaining weight for no reason, and these are all symptoms of lupus. So I've been helping people figure out, you know, when they've got various symptoms, how, what questions to ask their doctors, and to help them do elimination diets because there are foods that are triggers. Many people don't realize that white potatoes, uh, capsaicin, um, eggplants, those are actually foods that cause inflammation. So if you're already inflamed, you're only exacerbating that situation. So I kind of help bring awareness in that sense to things that people don't really think about when they start thinking about feeling ill. Yes, um, you mentioned it briefly, misconceptions. You, 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 you had the analogy of the headache. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what other misconceptions are there about lupus? People think that, um, you know, if you, and I hate to compa compare the two, but the other misconception is that lupus is something that you'll feel better, you know, if you, if you just eat right or if you just exercise because it comes with a high level of fatigue. They also think that 
someone who has cancer is in the worst case, and, and again, not necessarily comparing it, but just giving the misconception, and they say, well, that person is doing chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is also one of the treatments for lupus. Lupus causes hair loss, like, and, and, and it's not something that is like cancer, that once your chemotherapy is gone, your hair will grow back. Lupus can create hair loss permanently. Um, it can cause... The, the medications actually cause blindness and brain tumors, and there's always this ongoing thing that's happening, and lupus progresses, if you will, kind of over the years. There is absolutely no cure for lupus, and people will meet someone and they'll say, oh, Kelly has lupus, but she's doing fine, and most lupus patients have gotten to the point where the, even the medical professionals at times think that they're over-exaggerating or it's in their head because, again, it's taking three to five years to diagnose that. So many people think that um, lupus patients are being over-dramatic or melodramatic or there's not anything really wrong with them or that they're lazy. So there are really a lot of misconceptions that go with this disease. And uh, the fact that you can go into remission but even in remission, you may still have certain symptoms. So, for example, I mentioned that uh, the last hospital stay I had had uh, three major organs involved, but I could be in remission and then and my joints would just hurt. So there's still always some, some, some level of pain and there's always some level of management that has to happen. So those are just some of the things that people don't understand about lupus. Well, I'm sorry to hear some of these things, uh, Kelly. Um, you. you also mentioned briefly foods, saying yes. that things like eggplants were it's not very good. It it causes inflammation. Are mm -hmm. there any particular foods that you, as a diet or the nutrition, that you recommend to uh, well, to to help prevent lupus or to help soothe the pains or anything like that? Anything you recommend? Yeah, there's nothing you can do to prevent it, unfortunately, because they don't know what causes it. Um, but there are triggers that we know about, known triggers. Food is a trigger. Uh, stress is a trigger. Believe it or not, weather can be a trigger. So there are outside forces that we don't really have a lot of control over. However, as far as the food is concerned, what I did for myself is um, I did what's called an elimination diet. And I was very, very, very detailed and very, very strict about it because everybody is different. So some people can eat certain things and some people can't and, and, you know, we're affected differently. So, for example, I can actually eat white potatoes. It's recommended that you don't and I don't get any additional pain. However, if I eat eggplants, forget about it, that my, my body just doesn't like it. So I avoid those like the plague. So what I recommend is really each person doing their own individual um food diary and, you know, and, and being very strict about how you go about it. And unfortunately, an elimination diet with as many varieties of foods that we have, it takes a while and it takes real dedication. The other thing that I highly recommend for everybody, not just people who are battling lupus, is to stay away from processed foods. Um, and the, in the U.S. in particular, I think we're one of the largest culprits with the chemicals that are in our bodies and and I know that there's this big battle between vegans and vegetarians and meat eaters. And so my journey into being a vegetarian isn't because of the altruistic reasons that everyone else has. It's not about saving the animals or saving the planet. It's about saving my life. And um, the chemicals, I tell people, I said, you know, when a plant sets up in the U.S., the EPA goes out and they want to make sure that they're getting rid of that waste in the proper way. So they make sure it can't go directly into the water supply and it's not supposed to be anywhere near farms and that kind of thing. So you're now taking these chemicals that some of them are actually hazmat materials and you're putting them in your body and the EPA is not able to regulate that. So where are those toxins going? And as we have added more and more uh, chemically created foods into our system, the autoimmune disease numbers have picked up dramatically. So I feel like there is definitely a correlation between that and ever gone into remission 
is eating real food. They're not eating anything processed. We're not doing the chemically created, lab created foods. So again, the foods are very, very important, very detrimental. Gut health is, is really fundamental. And, you know, and, and we're not chemical processing plants. We need to stop eating that nonsense. Yeah, I've heard recently about some of the um, proponents, heard some of the proponents of vegetarianism and veganism. Uh, oddly enough, lately I've been experimenting with like a raw diet, red grapes, blueberries, green tea, or oh, spinach, a lot of spinach, I really like spinach. And uh, oddly enough, today, it's Friday the 11th right now, and this is actually my second day into doing a two-day dry fast, which I'll end probably in 24 hours or so from now on, Saturday, early morning, Saturday the 12th. So yeah, nutri- nutrition is very important. I've come to realize, uh, I realized this years and years ago, but experimented with different uh, diets. I ex- experimented about two years ago with a low carb diet just to see what would happen. Right. And then as of lately, and then no, nothing really, no, nothing much changed after that. But lately, past month and a half or so, experimenting with this diet, I don't feel overly different. Losing weight, which is nice. Um, I don't feel that much different, but hey, let's let's keep going because I, I know that in inside of me it's much better and much cleaner than say a year ago. Yes. So that's all the more reason to continue along this and uh, really yes. amplify it. Um, you you also mentioned diff- uh, unknown causes like the weather, and was the weather? I was very curious. Was weather one of the factors that you know you decide well decided to move out to the USA apart from the healthcare over there? Well, believe it or not, no, it actually wasn't because I lived in Florida. Uh, the weather where I am, I'm in Chiang Mai, Thailand, is very, very similar. It's warm pretty much year-round. We have a monsoon season uh, here and we what, a rainy season in Florida. It was really all about finding the best health care, which is what prompted my move. But I will say that it, being much warmer here... Uh, in Florida, in the winter months, if you care to call us getting a winter, when it would get down to the upper 60s and uh, high 70s, I actually would require gloves and a, and a hat because uh, in addition to having lupus, sometimes when you get the autoimmune diseases, you'll get something called Raynaud's syndrome. And what that does is it makes your extremities really cold even when it's not. So even th- here in Thailand, where, I mean, it, I don't think it really gets below, I think the lowest I've seen it so far is probably 77 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there are times when I've got my feet wrapped in a fleece blanket and it's really rather warm outside. So the, the weather is kind of weird. So I, I would never move to a place that has really, really cold weather simply because I probably would just be not a happy camper. Mm-hmm. You have to excuse me though, I'm a bit, a bit too European. Um... 77 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that in Celsius? I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 Celsius. Oh, really? Yeah. So it must be very, it must be very humid then over there because that's relatively warm. It's real, but it, but believe it. Well, I'm in the mountain region, so it's actually the only the only reason there is any humidity is because it's during the rainy season. But um, Bangkok being on the water, all the, the humidity is so thick you can cut it with a knife. But here in Chiang Mai, it's not so bad. In fact, um, yesterday it was rather warm. And again, it's the rainy season. And I've been here since October of last year. And yesterday is the first time I actually sweat. <laughs> like, I, like I had to actually dampen my forehead. And that was the first time in the entire time I've been here. And I realized that because it, I don't usually have to do that. And I was like, wow, this is unusual. So it stood out for me. Yeah, I see. Um, I don't know I don't know much about Thailand. So it's very curious. I always imagine that if people lived in Thailand, it'll be along the coast. You know, in in the in the bay, in the bay of Thailand, or you know, near Bangkok in that vicinity. But uh, you mentioned also Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, you so you moved you moved from the USA to Thailand, yeah. and what are you doing in Thailand exactly? Is it just purely the activism work, or? No, actually, I am. Um, I I came here a, a reluctant, I guess, digital nomad. Um, a laptop entrepreneur. So I am actually an active and avid YouTuber, um, social media that actually has nothing at all to do with my disease or awareness. I have a YouTube channel that I basically kind of share perspectives, common sense perspectives. So I take 
funny little questions, um, you know, and, and turn them into life lessons, so to speak, and, and give you a different perspective on things that you may have made assumptions about, for example, um, if you will. A lot of times for, you know, if you see the skinny girl, the really, really thin girl in the restaurant and she's got, she's eating a salad. And, you know, many people who are like, oh, wow, she looks unhealthy. She is the skinniest thing ever. She should probably be eating a cheeseburger. And I tease and tell people I'm the skinny girl who is the salad eater because red meat will cause inflammation. You know, so there's, you know, and I tell people, you don't know what that person's story is. When you're standing in the uh, pizza shop and you're looking at the heavy person and they're really, really picky about everything and you're getting upset with them because they're holding up the line and you're like, well, they're fat anyway. Why are they eat? Why are they being so picky? They eat everything. And I'm like, well, people have food allergies and there's medications that make you gain weight and you don't know that person's story. You know, so I kind of take things of that nature and share, you know, a, like I said, a different perspective on what a person is going through when when you're minding someone else's business you don't have their full story so i try to help people see things from a different point of view so that we can have a world that hopefully is a little more understanding and a little more tolerant oh yeah definitely working together more than working apart um so you mentioned a digital nomad yes and you chose thailand because of the weather and the healthcare. Yes. So what is life like in Thailand in general? You know, the, the day-to-day life, the cost of living, the health care, the transportation, the infrastructure. What is it like? Well, you know, a lot of people when I first came here, they're like, are they living in huts and riding elephants? And they are not. It is, uh, it's really not a big deviation from the U.S., to be quite frank with you. There are malls. And there, there's Uber and, you know, and in a lot of ways, they're a lot more advanced than we are. For example, in the U.S., you go into the, the mall and the escalators are just running, 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 running. Here in Chiang Mai, at least, you go into the mall and if no one's on the escalators, the escalator stops and then there's a motion sensor and then you get on and it's energy efficient and then the escalator moves. So um, there's a lot of things here that are, again, very much like the U.S. Uh, and but then there are other things here. Uh, the, the way that they eat is completely different. And if you enjoy spicy food, you can come here. And I think they have figured out how to cook fire. <laughs> the food is extremely spicy unless you ask, you know, for it not to be. There is a mode, you know, of public transportation within the city center, and especially in Bangkok. Bangkok has mass transit, so they've got the super trains and that type of thing. Um, so it really isn't that much different than living in the U.S., except for some of the conveniences you can't get. And obviously, the culture is quite different, and the cost of living is absolutely amazing. I will say that. And I really, you know, hate to say that because that means more people may come here and I really don't want them to come. I don't want it to ever be overcrowded. <laughs> but um, it, the cost of living, I, I live in the city center. I've got a two bedroom condo with a Western kitchen because the, the Thai kitchen is very, very small. Many, many people don't eat at home here because the food out is very good and it's, and it's very, very cheap. You can literally eat uh, three meals a day here if you eat the, the Thai food and ha- and be really full, like good food with organic vegetables and that kind of thing for about $7 a day maybe. And that might be me being a little Western and being, you know, I might get a little something extra, so that might be actually kind of expensive. But the food here is very, very cheap, very reasonable. To be a vegetarian or a vegan here is like um, a really good thing. They, that That's something that is like an honorable thing to not eat meat here. And you can find a vegan or a vegetarian restaurant almost everywhere. It's, it's insane what you can find here as far as that's concerned. Um, my two-bedroom condo in the city center runs me just under $600 a month. And when I left Florida, I lived in a high-rise two-bedroom condo in downtown Orlando city center, and I was paying roughly $2,100 U.S. a month. So, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, please go on. So, I was just going to say, so by comparison, 
Uh, everything here is much cheaper. Healthcare, absolutely, for sure, is cheaper. I do physical therapy twice a week. It costs me 500 baht. 500 baht basically uh, translates to about $15. USD and the U US it would never cost me that much. My copay on insurance would have been more than fifteen dollars per visit. So I'm able to actually get the health care that I need here. When I first arrived, uh, I got here the third of October, and around the seventh of October, I want to say I was hospitalized. So I was hospitalized right away coming here to Thailand. And I think I was in the hospital, I want to say that stay was roughly five days with a vegetarian diet and, and gourmet cooked vegetarian diet in the hospital. Um, all of I had four specialists, a cardiologist, because again, my heart swelled up, a hematologist, because they were afraid my brain was going to spontaneously bleed. Lupus has a lot of fun stuff, new surprises all over the place. Um, I had a general practice doctor. And I can't remember the fourth doctor. Oh, I think the lupus specialist was the fourth doctor. And when I got done with my bill, they, with the IV meds, the special diet, the four specialists, and I left with all of my prescription meds, my entire bill was roughly 1600 USD. And, th and that was it. That was the entire bill. And, and in the States, how much would that normally be? Oh, wow. Mm. <laughs> in the states it's hard to tell because first of all the very first thing that would have had to happen was an insurance carrier would have had to be contacted or you would have been sent to the state hospital where your care would have been subpar um, so I can tell you that in the time that it took them to diagnose me which was a rough, roughly a seven month span of time my, I had six figures between what I was responsible for and what my insurance carrier was responsible for. I had I left the U.S. with a six-figure bill for medical for seven months. So I would probably say that my hospital stay would have cost anywhere, especially with a cardiologist and a hematologist, I, that probably would have been a $40,000 bill. Easy. That is a massive uh, discount. Massive discount. That's that is uh, that's really huge. Um, wow. Yeah. So, uh, wow. Okay. So going back a little bit, you said that you moved to Thailand as a reluctant digital nomad. I'm yeah. contemplating right now myself moving moving abroad because all this stuff here, this setup, all this this business, even the one I'm even even the one I've got on the back burner. That are, are focusing more on this channel on this brand <clears throat> uh, is can all be done from anywhere in the world, and it's just a case of internet connection and get the setup, microphone, headphones, and all the rest. And one place that I was looking at, or I heard was good, was Cambodia to move there because there's not much law and regulation there. Cost of living will be incredibly cheap. But uh, a few episodes ago, I was talking to somebody else who's doing this digital, digital nomad stuff, and they said that you want to look for somewhere that's got a, a, a burgeoning middle class. Because for the burgeoning middle class, it shows that there's some affluence and that there's some there, there's some wealth to the country. So uh, his his logic was that uh, Cambodia was a bit too poor. But also, I was thinking about Mexico. But also, mm -hmm. as of lately, I was thinking about Marbella in the south of Spain, because oh. Spain. That area has got a lot, a, a, a very big middle class and a very high upper class as well. So you're around a lot of people that are smart and entrepreneurial already. So it's damn good for networking. Right. Um, what What are your thoughts on Thailand then for for digital nomads? Thailand is actually pretty phenomenal. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I've been looking at Portugal. I, I'm, I'm enjoying Thailand, but I've been looking at Portugal, and I hear that they've got a pretty good burgeoning uh, digital nomad scene as well. But here, Thailand, uh, Chiang Mai, where I am, is, if I recall correctly, the number one digital nomad spot. So you have a lot of people here that have no clue what they're doing, and then you have expert caliber that are making six figures a month. And there are always various events, uh, masterminds, different talks that are going around, you know, going on, that are going on around town, and often they're free. 
And I mean, and when I say, you know, that you're taking advantage of that one such guy that comes to mind, uh, I can't remember his last name, but I believe his first name is Taj. Um, Taj came here to Chiang Mai. He talked about 100 things that he, you know, he did to become, um, you know, by the time he was 30, I think it was, about gratitude. And then there's a digital nomad summit that is taking place in Portugal in September, and he's one of their featured speakers. And to go to that event, uh, one ticket, the early bird special, and I don't know how dollars and pounds break down, but it was 300 euro or 300 pounds or whatever that calculates out to. So, and, and it had, I know most people in the uh, digital nomad world know who Pat Flynn is. Pat Flynn is also on that list of, of speakers. So you get really high caliber people that come through here and then you get people who come here to get started and some make it and some of this is like the Hollywood of being a laptop entrepreneur, so to speak. You can start out here or you can burn out in flames here. But um, there really is a lot of knowledge here and people are willing to share it openly. And that's a really nice thing. And and I mean, the, the wealth of knowledge here for, for doing this is just insane. Um, I've been working online as a hobby since 2008 and just to come here and be able to share what I know, but also to be able to learn from some really heavy hitters has been amazing. I think it's really impacted what I'm doing uh, in a major way and the people are focused. And that's the other thing is that, you know, it's easy to get in a group of entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs and especially those that are laptop entrepreneurs because there's no structure and, you know, you can get lost in not knowing what to do. You can get lost in the busy work and not the work that really needs to be done. And the people here have really, you know, they're able to tell you that's not making you any money. It's a waste of time. You can play around with your logo all day long or you can create content and get that out there. So I really like the, the fact that you can come here and really make some really great connections and watch people go from nothing to successful in about a year. Well, that's interesting. I I didn't know this about the uh, number one number one place in the world, Chiang Mai, and, and this Digital Nomad Summit in September. I didn't know about that either. Yes, I've heard of Pat Flynn. He has the uh, podcast, the, um, I forgot what it's called now. Smart passive income. That's the one. Yeah. Not, yes, yeah. not, that's the one. Not the, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Oh, that's been around for a long time. I used to have a yeah. podcast in 2015 mm-hmm. that was partially inspired by that, but mostly inspired by Entrepreneur on Fire with John oh, Lee yeah. Dumas. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to do something like that back then, Daily Show, but it was it was nothing to do with entrepreneurs at all. It was more to do with uh, the games industry and interviewing game developers and. And um, talking about the, the 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 game that they're making now, so yeah, interesting. And three hundred three hundred pounds for yeah. a ticket there. That's early bird though. That's that's not too bad even at that. Exactly. In, in Portugal, it's not too bad. Yeah. And when you said um, you know, concentrating on stuff like the logo or 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 content all day, uh, I think you're referring to income producing activities, where yeah. it's like here's all daily, here's the day to day operational stuff. Here's the you know functionality to get the going, or here's the stuff that when you work on these things it increases the income or increases the awareness indirectly or directly for both of those things. Like this podcast is an income producing activity, brings awareness, brings traffic, brings attention, SEO things like that. Exactly, you know. But but the unfortunate thing is that you'll get people that'll come here and they'll say, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. And they start working on the logo and they start working on the headers and they start working on what I'm going to put, you know, the Facebook group header and the Facebook event header. And they never produce the podcast. So, you know, that's what you, they get so caught up in the minutia that you so being here, you you I mean, and, and not because they don't want to do their podcast. They think that that's important. You know, but really what's really important is getting the interviews in line and and talking to the people and actually broadcasting. That's more important. I will forgive that you don't have a logo if I can listen to you on because when I pull you up on, you know, SoundCloud or, or iTunes or wherever it is that I pull you up. I'm not sitting here staring at your I, your cover. I'm going to read what your podcast is about and then I'm going to subscribe and I'm going to listen. Well, funny enough, because this... This was about just under three weeks ago. 
Monday. I was thinking about it before that, like niggling on the fence with it. And then I hear about it and this and it says like you're missing out on all the networks and all the you know, being known, being heard, and it's like, well, okay, that's it, you know, the, the connections, and it's like, yep, that's it, went from on the fence, straight away to let's do it, let's do it, and then that was a Monday, and then by Tuesday, it was like, we had episode one recorded, and it was online, it was on YouTube, I'm not on SoundCloud or iTunes yet, I know how to get on them, it's just, uh, I have, yeah, I've been the exact opposite of what you you said, so people are focusing on the logos and all the rest now, you're all right, I've just gone straight into Go on different different sites, different places, inviting people, inviting people, Facebook and all the rest. The inaugural episode, who wants episode one? Who, who wants episode one? And it's like, now, your episode, you are actually episode uh, 26. Wow, nice. And today, I've uploaded episode um, 15, 14 today, so it's there's a massive backlog, which is good. Mm-hmm. But yeah. interestingly enough, that I'm actually working on a book at the moment. So what I'm going to do is, once I've finished about another 10 or so interviews with people I've got lined up in the next few days, uh, not invite anyone new to the show, <laughs> let all the episodes run through, or a week's worth, for example, uh, because i got plenty of content, plen- bulk uploaded, ready to, a book recorded, ready to upload. I want to focus on my book for a little while, like properly focus on that, to get that to a certain level or near completion, and then go back to this as well. Because yeah. I find that the, in the book I talk about the caches in the community, the caches in the people that follow you and the people yeah. that care, that care for the stuff you create and share with the world. Yeah, I agree. And, and the way that you're going about that too, Adrian, is exactly what you should be doing. You're not, you're not, uh, you know, you're not messing around with the things that don't bring, that don't produce income. And I mean, and even though the podcast is going to take a while to do that, you're building credibility. You're getting your name out there. You're getting the exposure. You sitting around messing with your logo and creating banners, that's not going to do anything for your business, for your credibility, for your recognition level, any of that. And then the fact that you created enough of bulk in there as far as what you've uploaded, that allows you to free up, like you said, some of your time, especially if you're, if you're only uploading, let's say, once a week, like some podcasters, you've got 26 weeks. You've got half a year worth of content, which gives you six months or at least four and a half before you have to start, you know, putting things in the bank, so to speak, of new interviews that allows you to be able to focus on your book, you know, so, and that's what a lot of people come here and they learn how to do that. They think that building logos and starting, you know, getting their brand, that is important, but it's not the most important. And so coming here to Chiang Mai and talking to some of the younger uh, people who are brand new to doing internet work, you really, they, I mean, they leave here with such focus and such a, a knowledge base that it is insane. But why do they have to go all the way to Chiang Mai and Thailand to learn those lessons? They can learn it at home. You know, the one thing about it is isolation is the killer. Um, when you're at home, because I had this, I mean, when I started my fashion blog, that's where I initially started my online um career, so to speak, you know, 2008, I've I've spent 17 years in real estate in 2008 in the U.S. The real estate market was falling into uh, disarray, if you will, uh, and I needed an outlet. And what I found was people think it's a game. They're like, oh, that's a hobby. It's not a real business. How are you going to make money doing that? And so what ends up happening is you're doing everything on your own. You're all by yourself. You don't have any support and you don't have any guidance or direction. And I mean, and they don't necessarily have to come all the way here. There are, you know, little hubs. I think Portland is becoming a big hub in the U.S. for uh, the, the laptop entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. But what happens is if you're in a place where people don't get it, you're learning all of this by yourself. Your your, your curve is, you know, your your opportunity for success is dramatically decreased. And when you're not starting to see any success, then you get discouraged and then you give up. And here, the, the conversation is almost everywhere you go in coffee shops and in restaurants, you can walk past tables and all you're hearing about is, you know, well, how are you monetizing that? What platform are you using? What resources are you doing? Well, how did you automate that? How many times a week are you posting? You know, so you're hearing this stuff everywhere you where you go. Whereas in the U.S., what you're hearing is, what are you doing? You're a dreamer. Why are you doing that? That's not a firm foundation. You're, you need to go out and get a real job. That's not going to 
take pay for your bills. You're you're you know pie in the sky. How long is that gonna take you? Oh, you you know I mean so you're you're hearing all this negativity. Whereas in a place like this where people have a, a open mind and they're seeing the successes and everybody's got some modicum of experience that can help you with one thing or another thing because you you know having your podcast. I'd mentioned to you early on that I've I'm considering starting a podcast. I've got a lot of other stuff going on, but a podcast is on my agenda. So if you wanted to do YouTube videos or um, Facebook groups and you didn't have a lot of knowledge on that, I could say, well, Adrian, here's what I know about that. And then when you, when I go to do podcasting, you could say, well, Kelly, here's what I know about that. And we're able to help each other get to successes faster because of feeding back and forth that information. And in a lot of places in the U.S., you just don't have that. Yeah, synergy, where working together you can create more than what you could create individually. Yes. And you mentioned that in the coffee shops, people are you know, talking about what they're doing and the strategizing. Is yes. That, is that just the culture of Thailand, or is that just a coincidence of the people that happen to be living in Chiang Mai? And that's the mindset they bring with them. That's the mindset they bring with them. The, the Thai culture is very, very, very laid back. And we're teaching them a lot when it comes down to that. Um, they're very um, hardworking people, like, and, and they're putting in what they can. But many of them are, are looking at us like we're, like we're the aliens, I guess, that we are to their country. And, you know, and, and when you tell them, when they say, well, what do you do for work? A lot of them figure as soon as you say online that you teach English. Uh, and so uh, they're still learning as well. So this is really the I, the mindset that the, the, the foreigner, if you will, has brought to their country. And we're here in Thailand primarily because, you know, startup costs on an online business is very, very low. But it also takes you a while to earn income. So you can live here, like I said, very reasonably. You can get a, a studio apartment here. For you know, 150 to 250 U.S. dollars, and like I said, you can eat all day for five to seven dollars. So to live here and start a business that doesn't have a lot of overhead is dynamic. It just it, it makes all the difference in the world, and it gives you the ability to really concentrate and not stress over your your income uh, to, to, to be able to walk out of here. Again, I've seen these kids come in here. Um, at barely making it, and eight months, nine months later, they're leaving here with you know five figures a month. Oh, cool, interesting. Um, but Kelly, as we begin to wrap up this uh, podcast, what is it you're working on now exactly? You said you got a podcast of your own to work on. But what yeah. else are you working on? What else, you know? What's next for you? Um, I'm actually doing courses um, where I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a joy junkie <laughs> and I'm a bit of a goofball and um, I believe in affirmations and visualizations and I've got some skills as far as selling. Like I said, my background is from um, from real estate and I've got quite a few years in on, on uh, helping people monetize their websites and that kind of thing. So I'm actually working on building passive income streams in all of those areas. Uh, of affirmations and visualizations and helping you move towards success and helping you get creative in monetizing your business because most people don't, you know, they, they get stuck on, I've got to have a blog, I've got to have a podcast, I've got to have a YouTube channel. And there's so many other ways for people to monetize. So I actually help people through that. And that's what I'm working on currently is building out courses that I can kind of free up some of my time, but also still help you build your business. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think affirmations, yeah. affirmations are very important. Expanding the comfort zone, realizing that you can do new things. I've started to realize the importance of breath and breathing. Yes. And oddly enough, the podcast before, I think just now, or episode 25, uh, the person talks a lot about the the emotions, expressing your emotions, and these can really clog up what you to think and believe and what you can and can't do, and the yeah. importance of breathing and the importance of, uh, and also realize through meditation as well, yeah. the importance of where you put your attention and focus and where you put your awareness, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it talks about how people used to say we only use 10% of our brain, but uh, we actually use all of it, but 
We use 10% of our brain for our good. All the rest is negative or drawing back, you know, like the negative thought or negative belief, disempowering, stuff like that. But the way I see it is that we can only have one thought in our mind at a time. So it might as well be something positive, uplifting and empowering. Exactly. Exactly. And what I found is as far as, you know, because I've been using affirmations before I knew that that was what they were called. Um, I tell people when they talk to me about affirmations, there are all of these people that have all of these certifications, and that's awesome. And they've got all of these letters behind their name, and that's great. I tell them the letters behind my name are S-U-C-C-E-S-S. I was an inner city Chicago youth, and all that that conjures in anybody's head that knows anything about Chicago and inner city. I was a Desert Storm veteran. I was a single mom who raised two kids, and I am living a an amazing life. I was a six-figure income earner. I've got two college-educated children that have never been arrested or, you know, given me disciplinary issues or any of those things. And it all started, and I remember um, sitting in my living room in Chicago and watching, and this made such an impact on me, watching a new segment on business, and it was sponsored by American Express. Again, I remember this like it was yesterday, and the newscaster said, for every one dollar that your employer pays you, he earns three. And that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. I was like, I'm not going to let him make three dollars and I'm only going to get one. And from that, I have done a lot of different things. And what I did was I sat down and I wrote out my first set of affirmations, my goals. And I think that um, the difference is, of course, is the, the, the energy that you put into it, the dedication that you give to it, um, the wording, obviously, and being able to visualize that. And, and I've had people say to me, well, you know, I've done affirmations on becoming a millionaire and I visualized it and nothing happened. And I tell them affirmations are like faith based things or goals. They don't work unless you do. You can't just say them and you can't just, um, you know, visualize it. There's action steps and that's why you're saying them and it's why you're visualizing them because when you, it's like watching one of those commercials on television for pizza. You see it and you're like, you weren't even thinking about pizza. You see it and it's like, oh wow, that pizza looks really good. I would love to have that pizza and you start imagining having that pizza and the next thing you know, you're on the phone calling up the pizza delivery guy. You know, so if you don't call up the pizza delivery guy, you can sit there all day long and your mouth can water all day long, but your stomach's going to still be hungry and you're still going to just be imagining. So when you're doing affirmations and visualizations, they are to be at the top of mind to catapult you into action. So, you know, and I tell everybody that, again, I started this way back when, when I was a, you know, when I was a teenager and I didn't know what I was doing. But I can tell you that everything that I've ever said that I wanted to do has come to fruition for me. And there is a reason for that. So we want to tell ourselves good things. We often don't know what we should say because we are, like you said, inundated with so much negativity that as soon as we have a positive thought, there's a, the next thought behind it is, well, what if it doesn't work? And what if people think I'm foolish? And if I lose my job and all these things but if you are constantly, like you said, having that one, you know, this thought after this thought after that thought, and then you're adding visualizations of that, eventually you're calling the pizza guy and you're taking action. And when you do positive steps towards something, you can't help but get positive results. And they may not be exactly what you thought, for example, Years ago, um, 2001, I visited Ireland. It was the very first time I'd ever left the United States and gone over water. I'd gone to Mexico and that kind of thing, but I'd never crossed, you know, I'd never gone overseas. And when I got there, I had such a wonderful experience that right away I started saying, I'm going to move abroad. I'm going to live abroad. I'm going to live abroad. I'm going to live abroad. And that was part of my um, thing that I put on my goal list. Then I started saying, I am I am living abroad. I am living abroad. I am. And I started visualizing the different places that it was like, oh, you know, living me living in Ireland and, and seeing the spray painted sheep and, you know, visiting the castles. And, and I started seeing, you know, these things. And then I started putting things in place. I started taking more international trips. And now, you know, here I am in Thailand. 
So you have to put those things in the place so that they are, you know, so and, and take positive steps so that those things will, you will have a positive outcome. I Tylen was never on my radar. Me being ill was never obviously part of what I wanted when I got ready to look for a place to move abroad. So circumstances sometimes happen not in the way that you thought they were going to, but I wanted to retire at 50. I retired at 47. So it came out a little bit better in my favor. <laughs> you know, so you just don't know what life will bring you. But I can tell you that if you don't take the, the steps to try to get what you want out of it, it won't bring you anything that you really wanted. So be a, be in control and and chart that, you know, write that map for yourself. Yeah, definitely. Taking life into your control. Yeah. But uh, Kelly, what are the best ways for the audience to get in touch with you? They can visit me on kellymccray.com and I'm spelled K-E-L-L-I-E. -L -L -E. M is in Michael, C is in Charlie, R, A is in Apple, E is in Edward, kellymccray.com. Or they can find me on uh, my YouTube page, uh, my uh, YouTube, which is um, youtube.com backslash hurricane in heels. And pretty much if they look for me on social media anywhere, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, I'm going to be under Hurricane in Heels. But my blog is kellymccray.com. Oh, cool. I'll add those in the link below. Awesome. In, in the description below. But Kelly, it was great having you on the show. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. I love to be able to talk. <laughs> That's good to know. And ladies and gentlemen at home, if you haven't already, click on the subscribe button below, or if you're on YouTube, and then also press the bell notification right next to it for the latest uploads. How cool is that? Because this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So go out there today, right now, and do something remarkable with your life. That's what it's all about.